This is a special podcast presentation from 700WLW.com. This is Doc Thompson On Demand. I didn't want it there. I didn't put it there. But it's on the calendar of my cell phone. I'll share with you what I found over the weekend at 1033 this morning. At 1110, your shot at $1,000. It's Doc's Money Shot every morning on 700 WLW. I didn't realize it. In fact, it, it's really kind of confusing. The way Ohio funds public education, the money we get for our local communities from the state is really, I think, kind of convoluted. And I think it encourages us not to pass different levies. Rich Hoffman joins me now from No Lakota Levy. How's it going, buddy? Hey, I feel like I'm in a canoe in the middle of a hurricane. <laughs> <laughs> so let me, let me get this straight. Maybe you can lay this out because I know this is something you've spent a lot of time on. Ohio adjusts the amount of money that they give to local school districts based on what they think is going to happen in that district as far as local levies. Is that right? That's partially right. It's also uh, contingent on you know the wealth of the district. Um, well, you know, one of the factors of that is, like, they say, take for instance Middletown, who receives uh, quite a bit of, is considered a wealthy district because it has AK steel in it. You know, so the, you, I know in Lakota, the, the property value assessment, you know, even for commercial business, is the same as residential business. So AK steel sort of, you know, tops the, you know, the people who live in the surrounding area aren't wealthy. It's the AK steel that makes it appear that way. So on, on uh, the books in Columbus, it looks like a great wealthy district. Okay. So, I get so much money. Right. So first off, we, I've known for a long time, and I think this is outrageous, that if you live in a wealthier district, you end up paying quite often through the state yep. for poorer districts. They say, yep. well, if you live in a poor district, that money should have, you know, they should have a great education. Why should you have a good, and so on and so forth. So I get that. Yes. But doesn't it encourage then with this, if, if they're saying um, you're not passing levies so you don't have as much money on top of you know a situation like Middletown and AK Steel, if you don't pass that then, the state then has to kick in more money, right? That's, that should be Partially. the theory. That should be a theory, but that's not what happens. But what happens is they just put it on, uh, they just put another issue on the ballot six months later because they know the money's there, so they'll just keep pounding until you get it. This whole system is ridiculous. Yeah, it's horrible. Absolutely horrible. And it you know, Rich, this, this goes back to if, if you are in a poor district right now and you are ticked off at what I just said because you're saying, well, Doc, those rich districts, so on and so forth, you need to join me and my idea of it's time to, to really bring the quality of education throughout Ohio and every state to the same level, the same amount of money by doing it online. Putting right. the bulk of it online, and then we all level out. It needs to come. And the, the cost of education by itself needs to come down. I mean, the, the cost per pupil, and we've seen that the, they, they spend like $15,000 per kid out of Princeton, and they're not excellent with distinction. Um, like Lakota is excellent with distinction. It spends, you know, in the mid-9,000 nine, uh, 9, range. And, uh, you know, so the, the, what you're spending doesn't guarantee you good quality you know it's it, it's a built in a lot of things it's it's, you, it's the quality of the community and all that kind of thing and the, the, how much the parents you know invest in the kid it's, it's so many factors and to say that money alone is the is the thing is absolutely preposterous but we're basing everything on school funding on that formula that money equals success and it doesn't all right i'm going to go down some of those you're, you're absolutely right some districts that spend a lot have a a poor you know record some yeah. that spend very little have a great record i'm going to run down those in a second but here, here's how you have to think about it. If, if you have a school district and you put a bunch of money or not a lot of money, what do you get and what do we want to get for our money? Well, first of all, I would think overall we should all be able to agree that you want kids who are learning, kids who are graduating and prepared for a future, right? Exactly. Okay, so as we just said that there are some districts that throw a lot of money at schools, don't necessarily do well. Some throw very little money at schools, they do very well. That, that doesn't matter. What else do you get beyond that, though? You kind of alluded to it. Um, better quality of community, maybe extra services, a better football field, a better building, all of those things, right? Right, right. I think a lot of people think that the quality, I think a lot of people get caught up in the whole Friday night lights mm-hmm. situation where, you know, you know, if you're out of school and you have a kid attending school, you tend to look at the football games and you get wrapped up in the whole spirit part of it. And you think that the whole public education system is involved in the sports programs. And that's just, that's just a benefit. That's just an entertainment function. 
a lot of people don't look at what's real. What are they really getting? How well are kids really prepared for college? How much are they really capable of, you know, putting together a family when they get out? And how well is home ec doing for a lot of these kids? I mean, you, you know, you, you guys have covered a lot of stories about kids that aren't very well prepared when they hit, you know, 21, 22 years old. But we are teaching them quality sex ed. Just ask Mason. Oh, that's disgusting. <laughs> oh, I don't think you want to. They're doing their part with sex education they in Mason sure School. Yeah, that's, that's what they were that's what they were after. It's an outreach program outside of school. They're reaching out for yeah. home tutoring. <laughs> home tutoring. Horrible. <laughs> All right, so here's what it is, Rich. Okay. So we agree that um that the extra money really ends up going for things like you said, the Friday night lights, the extracurriculars, football field, uh, maybe some additional types of classes. Then what we should be able to agree on is that quality, that basic quality of education for everybody in the state to say, here's the money you're going to get. We're going to dump everything online. We're going to let you test out of classes, learn at your own pace, all of these different ideas that I'm sure if we got together, we'd come up with. And then you are assured a bare minimum of materials and uh, accessibility of those materials, tutoring, all of that stuff online, regardless of poor, uh, rich, rural, urban, it doesn't matter, that's all online. Beyond that, then, we could restructure and say, if you want to pass a levy so your local school district where your kid isn't going, you know, nine to five, so to speak, anymore, they can go different times, because you want this big, beautiful football field, fine, then you tax yourself and you pour the money into it. Absolutely, and that's, that's precisely how it should go. But unfortunately, just like with you have when you talk about the federal government or you talk about anything we spend money on, you have one side who believes uh, in this sort of progressive ideology and have another side that kind of believes in a conservative ideology. And we ask these logical questions, well, why can't we do this? Well, because there's all this other this, – there's this whole other group of people who believe that – the you know this Keynesian thing works, and you can't get past that debate because of that emotional argument. And and as long as it stays on just these emotional discussions, where it's oh well, we're going to put money into kids. It, it, this money is going to be spent on these children, and if you don't spend it, you're bad. You, you can't get you can't even have the discussion you're talking about because it never gets off the ground. You got yeah, you got a lot of people that have ulterior motives as this, and yeah. some of them comes down to you know protecting jobs and whatnot, stuff like that. Yeah. I'm looking at some of the different schools in the area, and this was reported, the statistics were listed in the Enquirer, um, of who spends what and, and how they're rated. And just looking at, you know, by the amount spent, if you look toward the top of the list, you got schools like uh, Marymount, they get an excellent rating and they spend per student about $13,000. This was in 2010. Right. Right. Um, but then the next two on the list right below it, at just a few hundred dollars less, you've got Hamilton, Winton Woods. Mm-hmm. They get a continuing improvement, and they're spending almost as much. Yeah, they're not doing too well. And that tells you that there's uh, other socioeconomic factors that come into play. You know, and really it comes down, and, and we, we talked about this in a Lakota thing the other day where I, it, I, I feel like a lot of the, the, the you know, you want you, we hire the the teachers and these people to do a good job, but it really is reflective of the community. It's the parents that care and ask the kid when they come home from school, "Hey, what'd you do today?" Well, I did, the, and, and it's that participation. It's sitting around the dinner table, and if they don't do it, at least the parents are at least engaged in their child's lives. And when you find some of these communities that don't have, you know, there might be single parent homes or have a disproportionate amount of them, you find that you have the situation you have like in Winton Woods. Nothing against them, but they've thrown tons of money to try and improve it, and you, we found that you can't spend money to fix that social problem. All right, then you got in Claremont County toward the bottom of the list, they spend uh, a couple of thousand dollars less than <laughs> Marymount. Yeah. You got uh, New Richmond, they get distinction. You got, um, let's see here, uh, Claremont Batavia, they get an excellent rating and they only spend $8,000. So let me, you get an excellent rating at Marymount for $13,000 per student per year. All right. You get an excellent rating also in Batavia, for eight thousand dollars a year, right. five thousand dollars less. How is Batavia able to do it, and how come Marymount isn't doing the same thing? Well, I know that it's all you know. Every time I bring it up, it's 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 taboo and it's evil. But these are these are these are all salary related. These are wages, and you find the districts that have thrown money at it, and they have all these all these expensive uh, teachers at the end of their contracts because they haven't had any kind of cap. And you know they they're getting paid a lot, and it takes up a lot of salary room. And uh, some of these newer, some of these other schools, you know, they have teachers that they have a whole different wage uh, wage makeup. But you see that the 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 what the kids are learning and the distinction and all that. Kind 
kind of stuff. That is totally separate. They're all getting their curriculum from the state of Ohio. It, it really doesn't, shouldn't matter at all. Every school district right now, it doesn't matter how, whether you're excellent, it doesn't matter whether you're poor, unless you have the best rating in the state, unless you have an excellent rating and you spend the least amount, you should be looking at the school that does. Locally, that would yeah. be a school like Batavia, and you should say, wait a minute, how are they able to get an excellent rating and only spend $8,000 per year per student? You should look to them yeah. and say, okay, we've got an excellent rating now. Let's say you're Marymount, but we spend $5,000 more. How can we drop $5,000 less off of, you know, per student and maintain that excellent rating? They should have meetings and seminars. They should be listening yeah. to Batavia and every school like it. Now, I think every superintendent in the state, I mean, that's what you're hired to do. If you want to be considered a CEO, you should look at it like a CEO. You should look at how much you spend per pupil. Always be looking for ways to drive down that average. You should be, if you're 9,000 now, like the code is, or 9,500, or whatever it is, and you drive it down to next year 8,000. 8,600, and the next year, 8,100. But you can't lose your excellent distinction. Every school should be looking to do that, not saying, well, you know, five years ago we passed 11, we haven't had more revenue since. That's insane. That's ir- it's irrelevant to this argument. There are exactly. schools that do it for $8,000. Mm-hmm. And now there may be mitigating circumstances, fine. Maybe you say, well, whatever it is, they're in an area, blah, blah, whatever, fine. But you ought to be able to get closer to it than you are now. L- look at it this way. I think that money is money wasted. It should be going back to the taxpayers so sure. they could put their kids through school, create jobs, whatever it is. Pay for, t- for, pay for your uh, school funds. Exactly. But if you're not going to and you're in Marymount that spends $5,000 more per year per mm-hmm. student, Rich, think about this. Yeah. If, they, if they only spent 8000 like Batavia, that's $5,000 a year they could give to every pupil over their high school career, yeah. totaling $20,000 that that kid could get out of school and go to college. Exactly. That is for, I mean, if you go to a community college or a less expensive school, there it is. There's college paid for. Right, right, right. And, you know, think how much money, if you did, if you did drive the cost backwards like we were talking about, think how much more money those people who live in those districts who really would have. need it, how would have. Mm-hmm. They, could pay, they could pay for their own kids to go to school or whatnot. Sure. All right, before I let you go, I'm talking with uh, Rich Hoffman from No Lakota Levy. Um, we uh, we kind of stirred it up last time I had you on a week or so ago with uh, the Lakota <laughs> school board there. Oh, yeah. I, uh, I kind of stirred it up, did I? Yeah, oh yeah. Which part of it do you want to talk about? <laughs> well, we've got we've got the Joan Powell thing. Yeah. Explain what happened. She's the school board president. Well, she's a school board president, and and she endorsed a couple candidates that are uh, you know pro levy supporters. And my question has always been, why do you guys wear these stupid levy pens? I mean, you'd be supported, but you're supposed to represent us as the taxpayers. You know, it sends a bad. You know, you say, it looks like you're all locked arm in arm. Who represents us? So she came out and she endorsed these these pro-levy people, and there's a, a person that sits on the board, and they're going to have a meeting tonight, and they've got to sit next to each other and look at each other, and she's come out openly campaigning against her because this person has started to kind of listen to the No Lakota people. And, you know, we've been, oh, well, all we've been trying to do is talk about what we just discussed. How do you drive the cost down and still keep your excellent rating? Yeah, well, there are schools out there doing it. That's quite reasonable to have that conversation. So it looks like, you know, through Joan, they're trying to stack the uh, board with these uh, pro-levy people because who knows what's going to happen to Issue 2. And even if Issue 2 goes, stays up or goes down, there's still going to be a culture change where we're going to be talking about, you know, we're going to have to have some sort of measurement to, you know, evaluate teachers. You can't just pay everybody these, these step increases. So we're going to go through that process, and it looks like to protect that union, they're, they're trying to stack up the, uh, the school board with people who think like they do. So there's a huge fight. And it's getting to be really, really, really ugly. But the most outrageous thing from Joan, though, is this idea that, and she comes, you know, with the flyer or whatever contact, yeah. the communication sent out to people that suggested blaming the people who are, are in dissension about some things, that somehow they're at fault and they're creating problems. Yeah. America was built on dissension. We are supposed to debate stuff and try to come to some reasonable consensus. Yep. To suggest that they should just fall in line and go along with, with her is absolutely ridiculous. It's absolutely preposterous. And as a leader, that's what the leaders are supposed to do. And, you know, not everybody always agrees. And at the end of the day, you always shake hands and go your separate ways and 
And uh, you know, you're, but I expect to hear arguments. I expect dissension. I certainly don't expect to see open lobbying for uh, you know candidates that are very pro levy. And that means that we're just going to have further taxation. That means that's that's what she thinks is the solution in the future. When you get to 2013 and 2014, they're looking ahead past that contract to what they can just stack up more tax revenue um, and get candidates that are actually going to push for it. And that's bad. What that's she, really bad. What she should have been doing is sending out flyers that say things like, huh, Lakota spends about $10,000 per student, and we have a you know an excellent, uh, well, with distinction rating. Maybe we could maintain that and spend a lot less, like like Ross in Butler or yep. uh, in Batavia. That's, that would, that's what she should be discussing. Yeah. That would have been a responsible thing. And I think if she wanted to come out and openly endorse candidates, she should have or could have. But you could have kept the current candidates out of it and not tried to smear the whole thing, because this makes you look bad for not bringing everybody together. If you're saying you have an out-of-control school board and you're the president and you're complaining about how everyone's working in separate ways, that's your fault. All That's right, your fault. Rich Hoffman, no Lakota Levy. Thanks so much for your insight, sir. All right. Have yourself it. a great day. It's Doc Thompson on the big one, 700 WLW. 9%? Are you the 1%? Maybe you're the 2%. The what? The 2%. Oh, I've got it on my blog at 700WLW.com. Find out if you are the 2%. Ray on a cell, you're on the big one. Howdy. Hey there. You, guess, you asked how much am I paying on taxes? Yeah. I'm paying probably. Uh, Two hundred and forty dollars on every thousand, hundred thousand, I should say. That's a, uh, every month. Of that two hundred and forty dollars, fully sixty-nine to seventy percent of it is Cincinnati Public Schools alone. That's over the top of all the county, all the other city, everything. Cincinnati Public represents seventy percent. Right now, Lakota's got a levy up, but Cincinnati Public has a levy up. That levy is fully ten percent higher just by itself, and it's a permanent improvement levy. It'll never go away or be voted on again. Yeah, would you say that uh, you're getting a good uh, return on your investment for CPS? If I move one and a half miles, uh, I save five hundred dollars a year based on the costs that were laid out in the inquiry, and I jump up two ratings from my <laughs> middle C rating that I'm at right now. See, that's what's up. Ray, this is we are bogged down in this whole issue to Senate Bill Five thing, which first of all should not be lumping teachers and uh, administrators. Well. Um, uh, clerks and stuff like that as government workers with cops and firefighters, wildly different jobs, and they they should not be lumped together. But then we're bogged down in it discussing things like how much they make and all of this stuff. You can wipe all of that away. What is the goal of a public school? To educate kids, prepare them for the future. Are there, st- uh, are there st- uh, districts in the state doing that? Absolutely. Are there some that are not? Yes. Some do succeed, some do not. Is that based on what they get, monetarily speaking, the amount of money per student? No, it's not. How do we don't point that out? That's where we need to focus. Why do some districts throw gobs of money per student and get very little success? Some are able to do it much more efficiently. How are they able to do it? Well, let's find out. If some districts are able to do it for a fraction of what other ones are able to do it, we should be using the model of those other districts, the ones who are doing it spending very little. It's that simple. There may be mitigating circumstances, and not everybody could probably get exactly that amount, that low amount per student, but you can get a heck of a lot closer than you are now.